package of psychology and mental health resources to facilitate your research. And there will be lots of great topics to discuss today. So let's dive in and welcome our panelists. First of all, welcome Professor Velasio Bracolius from School of Medicine, Western University of the Western Sydney University. And Professor Bracolius is the editor of Australia, Austria, Asia Psychiatry. And we also have Dr. Elizabeth Edwards, Senior Lecturer and Director of Research from the University of Queensland, and Dr. Wendy Lee, and she's an Associate Professor of Psychology and Associate Dean for Research in College of Healthcare Science at James Cook University. And Professor Marilyn Campbell from the Faculty of Creative Industries, Education and Social Justice at Queensland University of Technology. And we also have Dr. Ling Ning Tian, Managing Editor from Sage Publications, and Halima Ibrahim, Partner Success Executive for Open Access from Sage, and who will introduce Sage Open Access at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to leave us a message on the chatting board. Our panelists will answer in QA session after each speaker's pr presentation. So let's come to the first topic. Welcome Professor Velasio Bracolius, the editor of Australia Asia Psychiatry. This is a journal of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. Professor Bracolius is a psychiatrist, researcher, and educator who is internationally recognized for his research that aims to better understanding of obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders. Yeah, and that's from me, so we will turn it to Professor Bracolius. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Candice, for the lovely introduction. And thank you to you and Susie for organizing and inviting me to speak um, at this event, um, at a wonderful event, very well attended from what, what you told me. Uh, so as uh, Candace said, I'm the editor of Australasian Psychiatry, which is a local journal that publishes articles that relate to psychiatry and mental health in Australia and New Zealand and the Asia Pacific region. Uh, but as a psychiatrist, my main area of research is in obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, so I've tried to present something that may be of interest to a broader audience on obsessive compulsive disorder, and hopefully I'll allow some time for questions. So the first question is, what is obsessive compulsive disorder? You probably all have your preconceived ideas, but the definition uh, is that it's a disorder characterized by obsessions and compulsions. And you can see in the boxes here, the definitions of an obsession, the definition of a compulsion. So the obsession is a recurrent, intrusive and distressing thought, image or impulse that then leads to distress or anxiety. Uh, that's followed by a compulsion, which is a repetitive behavior or mental act that leads to temporary reduction in the anxiety. And it's only temporary because uh, very soon after that, there's another obsession that pops up and the whole cycle repeats again, unfortunately. And obsessive compulsive disorder in order to meet criteria for a disorder needs to be dis distressing. It needs to be disabling. So it has an impact on one's ability to function and to work and to live a normal life. And the obsessions and compulsions should take more than one hour per day. And obsessive compulsive disorder, according to this definition, occurs to in one to two percent of the population. However, many of you know that there are many other people with obsessions and compulsions that don't have the disorder that are able to function. So many people say to me, Oh, I have a bit of obsessive compulsive disorder. And the statistics indicate that about 10 to 20 percent of people experience some obsessions and some compulsions but don't have the full-blown disorder. So the problems related to obsessive compulsive disorder is that it takes many patients a lot of time uh, many years to ask for help so it can take on average 10 years to ask for help. 
patients are often embarrassed and they keep their symptoms secret. Sometimes they're not sure if it is a disorder or just a bad habit. And sometimes they've even been told to worry about it. But they certainly do need to worry about it. Unfortunately, less than 40% of people will receive a treatment. And even health professionals are often unsure how best to manage and treat people with obsessive compulsive disorder. And so it remains under-recognised and under-treated. The other complicating factor is that not all obsessive compulsive disorder is the same. So you probably know that some people with obsessive compulsive disorder have these of contamination and excessive hand washing, but that's not the case with everyone. Other people have excessive checking. So when they're leaving their house, they need to check the doors are locked. Other people need things neat and tidy uh, and can't have things out of place. Other people have intrusive thoughts that they might stab someone or hurt someone or do something terrible to others. And others have thoughts that aren't really seen by others. Uh, for example, repetitive counting or repetitive need to pray. So doing things in one's mind in order to overcome their distress or their terrible thought. So there are many different symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder. Additionally, there's lots of comorbidity. So 75% of people with obsessive compulsive disorder will have a co-occurring anxiety disorder. Uh, more than 50% will have had a major depressive disorder. 10 to 30% will have had a co-occurring tick disorder. And about half the patients will have what we call obsessive compulsive personality disorder or an anagastic personality disorder. And that's often confused with obsessive compulsive disorder. So that's where people actually like to do things perfectly. They like to have things in their place. They have to take control of the situations. They can be a little bit stubborn in their personality. This is not the same as obsessive compulsive disorder. Only half patients with obsessive compulsive disorder will have obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, and we see a lot more obsessive compulsive disorder, personality disorder in people that are, uh, are professionals, people like doctors and teachers, pharmacists, pilots, where checking and rechecking and perfectionism is actually valued within the profession. And unfortunately, about 10% of people who had a history of a suicide attempt. So it can be very serious disorder and a very disabling disorder. In fact, it's among the top 10 most disabling of all medical conditions. So how do we treat this disorder? Well, the core components really are a therapeutic relationship. So having a good and trustful, trusting relationship with your patient and the patient having a relationship, of course, with a therapist so that they can talk about these very embarrassing uh, symptoms and very distressing symptoms. An understanding of the biopsychosocial aspects, so not only the biological aspects, so perhaps there's a genetic history, family history of OCD, uh, perhaps there's a need for medication, but also the psychological aspects. So what are the, what is the reasons as to why the OCD has come about now? what's sort of exacerbated the symptoms, and what are the social aspects? So the social aspects might be things like the wife saying to the husband, if you don't get help, I'm going to leave you. So all these things need to be considered within an assessment. Another important component is psychoeducation. So ensuring that we provide education to the patient, we, we tell them that this is a genuine disorder, this is something that needs to be treated, that there are obsessions, there are compulsions, that they work in this cycle that I mentioned at the start, so that patients can feel that they can try to understand and try to control their symptoms rather than letting the OCD control them and taking over their life. Family assessment is important, particularly for young people, because parents can often be over-involved in their children's care. They can often do some of the compulsions for the patients, for example, cleaning things for the patients or checking things or providing excessive reassurance, which unfortunately makes the disorder worse. We need to have a recovery focus. So we need to ensure that people's symptoms are better, be, uh, that when they're better, that they start to do things like work or study. And so they focus on more productive things rather than their obsessive compulsive symptoms. 
Exposure response prevention therapy is a psychological therapy which tries to encourage patients to expose themselves to the things that they fear, so touch something that they perceive as contaminated, and then prevent the response, so prevent them from washing their hands so that they experience the anxiety and that over time they become desensitized to that anxiety. Obviously, it requires graded exposure, so we don't just get someone to touch a toilet bowl, for example, when they've got contamination fears, because that would be overwhelming. But we talk to the patient and try to work out what might be achievable. Um, for example, it might be as simple as you know, being able to go to the shops or to sit on a chair that someone else has sat on or to touch a pen that someone else has um, touched. So that's what we call exposure response prevention. And finally, there's medication. And there's a whole range of medications that are used for obsessive compulsive disorder. But the first line treatment is what we call a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So a particular type of antidepressant that focuses on serotonin. And patients need to be treated for a, with higher doses and for longer periods of time than would be uh, than you would see response for in someone with depression. There are many different areas that are currently being uh, researched uh, for obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, so new types of therapies include transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy, deep transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy. So it's a different type of, of what we call TMS. Uh, deep brain stimulation, which is more of a, a surgical and invasive procedure where someone has a, a device like a pacemaker on their chest wall and they have leads that go into the basal ganglia in the deeper structures of the brain um, to activate that and to turn off some of those compulsions and obsessions. There are also other surgical ablative techniques such as focused ultrasound um, and gamma knife therapy uh, whereby um, patients, th those areas that we think are affected in OCD are burnt or ablated, um, and that leads to some relief in symptoms in some patients, obviously the more severe and disabled patients who don't respond to medication and to exposure response prevention therapy. There are trials in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Uh, there are trials on virtual reality exposure, and of course, a lot of movement in early intervention and prevention, um, which I see myself as leading, uh, as a, one of the leading researchers. Um, and as I was mentioning before, we we came to the to this webinar um, with some of the the other speakers that you'll hear from. Uh, I've developed a program whereby uh, there's an education program for parents, school counselors, and teachers, so that children. Uh, uh, their, their symptoms, so the symptoms when they develop in children are picked up quickly and early and that people get the help that they needed because unfortunately uh, I've seen fairly young patients um, you know in their teens and they commonly say to me actually I've had OCD for a long time um, I've had it probably from late primary school uh, but I didn't know what it was I didn't know how to get help um, so we're hoping that that extra information will assist people and that people may have a better outcome if they get the help that they need earlier on. So I want to finish now so I can let, allow five minutes for questions. Uh, but I want you to remember that we need to ask about symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, patients are often embarrassed to talk about these symptoms and it's often overlooked um, and dismissed by people. So we need to ask and we need to, to realise that it is a, it can be a very much a distressing and disabling disorder. There's a lot of comorbidity. It tends to be the rule. So it's not just OCD. It can be anxiety, it can be depression, it can be obsessive compulsive personality as well. Uh, we should make sure when we see patients that they've had exposure therapy. Often patients come to me and they have not had exposure therapy. They've seen a psychologist and they've had some um, relaxation therapy, but not any exposure therapy. So it's important to ask patients, have you been given tasks in order to make you feel anxious? 
uh, has, has the psychologist actually asked you to touch things that you think are contaminated or try not to check the lock before you leave the house. We also need to make sure that the patients, if, if they have need medication, that they've had high doses of the serotonergic antidepressants uh, and that they've had some trials of, of those to ensure that that's helped before we deem them as treatment resistance. But it is important to know that although few people are cured, most people can get a lot better. So about 50 to 60% of patients will actually have a significant improvement in their symptoms with treatment. Only about 10% will be going to remission and 10% will remain chronically unwell with very uh, limited response to treatment. So that's my talk, my brief talk on obsessive compulsive disorder, a disorder that I've devoted my life to researching so far. And I hope um, you found that interesting and um, I'm open for, for questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bill, for sharing your research insight. And I, I saw the questions is all about uh, whether we provide certificate of participation. Yeah, uh, I will answer this one. Um, there will be a questionnaire in the chatting box later. So uh, if you want to get the certificate of particip participation or um, reach out to Sage more academic resource. So please uh, fill in the questionnaire later. Yeah, so next we will uh, have Dr. Elizabeth Edwards for the next part. And Dr. Edwards is an editor-in-chief of Journal of Psychologists and Counselors in Schools. This journal oh, sorry, is- Sorry to interrupt there, there were actually were some questions on uh, how do we pick it up in schools. Would you oh. like me to answer those considering I've still got three minutes? I'm happy for oh, you to yes, do that. Yes, yes, Yeah, I just missed this yeah. question. No, no problem. Um, so we've got two questions here on how do we equip teachers to actually identify and, and what can they do in the classroom? Um, so... It's about identifying it. It's about not embarrassing the child in front of other children. Um, some patients that I see uh, have said to me, look, the teacher's embarrassed me. They've, you know, they've identified it. They've made the other kids laugh at me. So it's about identifying that uh, and also uh, referring them on, referring to the school counsellor so they can have a more confidential discussion about how they can get help with their symptoms and not uh, singling them out too much, being aware that they've got that difficulty and encouraging the student um, to do the things that they're afraid to do. Um, we've got a lot of tips on this online resource, which should become freely available later in the year. Um, and that will be um, there, like we said, for school counsellors, teachers uh, and parents so that people can, first of all, identify and secondly, provide some referral on for some treatment for those young people suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder. Thank you for allowing me to, to answer those questions. Uh, thank you. So um, can we go into the next session? Yes. Yeah. So next we will have Dr. Elizabeth Edwards, the Editor-in-Chief of Journal of Psychologists and Counselors in Schools. And this journal is published in association with Australian Psychologists and Counselor in Schools. And Dr. Edward is also the Senior Lecturer in the School of Education in the University of Queensland, where she is currently the Director of Research Innovation and Higher Degree Research. And her research spans education and psychology. Dr. Edwards has an international reputation for contributing to understanding the link between anxiety, attention, and memory. Her latest work focuses on the translation of theory-driven basic science into treatment for clinical problems, specifically for children and adolescents. So we'll turn to Dr. Edwards. Hi everyone, 
Um, thank you for that introduction and um, also thank you to the previous speaker because that was a, a nice segue to talk about uh, childhood anxiety and uh, in particular I want to share a program of research that I'm doing to hopefully close the treatment gap and I'll explain to you what that is. Before I do, I wanted to play a little bit of a video for you about anxiety. Sorry, I will talk first of all about what anxiety is, the treatment gap, and then I'll explain the program of research to you. We all know what anxiety feels like. And it feels uncomfortable, sometimes even unbearable. So we're led to think that anxiety is a bad thing. But anxiety serves an important function, and that is to avoid danger. For example, we're supposed to feel anxious or uneasy when standing on the edge of a cliff to help us feel safe. And we're supposed to feel anxious or a little worried about taking an exam because it motivates us to perform better. Anxiety prepares us for action. On the other hand, disordered anxiety is when the worrisome feelings seem to take over our life. Disordered anxiety makes us fearful and want to avoid certain situations. And the harder we try and make it go away, the stronger it gets. Disordered anxiety is when one of two things happen. First, when we think and feel in danger, when in fact we're safe. And that could be irrational thoughts of danger, like I'm going to make a fool of myself, or feelings of danger, physical sensations like a racing heart or even panic. And second, when anxiety interferes with our daily functioning. So we might feel sick, and start to avoid or refuse to go to school or work. So what we already know about anxiety, other than what was in that uh, video, which I'm sure many of you can relate to, is that one in five people will experience anxiety at some point in their lifetime. And this mental health problems such as this have got a devastating impact obviously personally on the individual but also costs billions of dollars to national economies and um, one study showed that in Australia um, more than 40 billion per year was uh, the cost of mental health problems for the Australian economy. So we've known for almost a decade now that half of all lifetime mental health condition has emerged before adolescence. So my research is about um, childhood anxiety and I wanted to, and addressing that problem so that it doesn't progress to anxiety in later years. And I've got a couple of examples of childhood anxiety in the next little snip. Cora is 11. What happens when her mother finds that her daughter is unable to make a class presentation because she's so nervous? Rico is only eight. What happens when his father reports that his son is refusing to go to school because he hasn't got any friends, he's avoidant and anxious? Students like Cora and Rico are usually referred to psychological services or community groups. While such interventions provide excellent support, these services are stretched to the limit. Interventions for childhood anxiety are typically expensive to administer with one-on-one -on -one therapy from a trained professional, exacerbated by long waiting times and limited access to providers in the public health system. So we know from that little video that childhood anxiety is a little bit different to how it presents in adulthood. Um, it's excessive worry, which is similar, but more of an avoidance, some physical symptoms like the, the tummy aches and the headaches, shyness, crying um, when, you know, it's not such a, um, perhaps a, something to cry about. They're very attached 
social problems, perhaps it's aggression and refusing to go to school. And clinical symptoms are often recognised through links to other problems. So teachers will often recognise um, that the student is anxious because of learning difficulties, because of, you know, they're always um, looking for situations to avoid uh, the class or if it's a day where they have to present in front of the class, they don't want to go to school because they're anxious. Um, and when symptoms don't improve despite interventions. So this could be despite a teacher being aware that there's anxiety present in a, a young child, um, she makes those accommodations and it, it doesn't go away, the, the, the uh, symptoms persist. So when we talk about a treatment gap, we're talking about the discrepancy between the number of uh, people who require treatment versus those who actually receive it. And one study showed that 44% of young Australians are falling down this treatment gap. So parents reported barriers for seeking a treatment as being they didn't know where to go or, or had trouble getting to a mental health service. That was 31.8%. Then 40% couldn't afford it. Um, Brown 30% couldn't get an appointment and 40% lacked the knowledge of where to get help. So these are the reasons that our young people are not receiving the treatment that they require for those anxiety symptoms. So reviews of mental health services have highlighted we must start to look for flexible and affordable treatments. Um, and existing interventions are typically expensive to administer, require those one-on-one -on -one therapies um, with a, a trained professional or in the school setting with a, a school psychologist or school guidance counsellor. Uh, one researcher in the last few years, Kasdan, identified seven points that we need to focus on in terms of finding new evidence-based treatments. So an ability to reach those not well served, whether that be they, those that live rurally or can't access treatments because they can't get to services, um, capacity for a large scale delivery, no all the cost, administration by non-professionals. In other words, is there something that um, we don't have to rely on those wait lists for you know, clinical psychologists or therapists, mobility, adaptable for diversity and offer choice alternatives for the client's needs. So I guess this is where my program of research comes in. If people ask me what I do for my research area, I say that I use cognitive neuroscience to try and inform treatments for clinical problems. And in particular, it's looking at the link between anxiety and how we use and store information in our memory and shift our attention between tasks and problem solve. So particularly looking at um, all sorts of levels of anxiety, not just clinical levels of anxiety, and hopefully looking at how students can lower those anxiety levels to be able to work on the tasks in a classroom um, without that negative impact of anxiety. Um, I believe that schools are uniquely placed to deliver an intervention. So meeting those criteria that Kasdan um, specified, those seven criteria. And this is where my work is looking at a computerised program, which is delivered by teachers in the regular, uh, as part of regular classroom routine. So there's something called cognitive control training and cognitive control is your ability to control those processes that I was talking about, those attentional processes. And we know that, they, that those are the processes that are affected by anxiety. So when um, somebody's anxious, their worrying thoughts are sort of uh, consuming their ability to efficiently move their attention between tasks. So therefore, the performance of the task they're trying to do in the classroom is, is lower. And this work has mostly been done across a number of studies with adults. So there's a couple of studies that were with adolescents, 
And so one of the things we did was piloted to see whether or not with 100 uh, primary school students aged 8 to 11 who completed two weeks of daily cognitive training on an iPad in their classroom, we divided them into two groups randomly. One half did something called a PASAT task, which I'll explain in a moment, and the other half did what we call an active control task, which was something called a two-back task. I'll explain that shortly too. So the PASAT task requires working memory. So if numbers are presented orally through headphones, like a three and a two, the, young, the child has to um, respond on a touchpad five. They then get another number four and they have to add the two together, two and four, and respond six. So they've constantly got to be using their working memory to add the last two numbers together. This was the cognitive control training task. The two back task is simply just the digits three, two, four. And as they hear a new digit, they have to count two back and respond on the same touchpad what number, what digit they saw two back, two times back. What we learned was uh, that our results were really encouraging in this pilot study. And when we compared anxiety levels before training with after training, we found both groups reduced their levels of anxiety. So what we found was our cognitive control training task was spot on, but perhaps we thought our what we thought was a low load two back was perhaps too difficult. So it also reduced anxiety. So we decided to do a full blown systematic review. And those who've had some experience with that will know that that involves searching the literature and screening in our case, over 2000 articles in the area of cognitive control training with children and adolescents. And we narrowed it down to 12 that um, measured anxiety. And there was also studies there looking at depression pre and post. So we've now published that. And I'll leave that um, QR code for anyone for a moment if you want to have a look at that article. So in those 12 papers, we found um, targeted um, if we were targeting the three executive functions, which we know are inhibition, shifting, and updating of working memory for a duration of around about 11 to 15 sessions for 10 minutes a day in schools, we, we were pretty much going to be hitting the target of being able to reduce anxiety and comorbid depression. So we thought we were on to something. We developed a randomized control trial protocol um, and we set about with 15 sessions of that PASAT task. And this time we're comparing it to a one back because we really wanted that low load to demonstrate no change in anxiety and our cognitive control training or our the PASAT task to demonstrate reduced anxiety after the uh, 15 sessions of training. But we hit a bit of a snag because children complained that our tasks were too challenging and boring. Kids will love, you've got to love children. They'll tell you when something's not right. And um, many of our children, so we had high attrition, they withdrew from the training. And so we paused our data collection while we found a solution. We went, um, to the literature and some uh, researchers had started gamifying cognitive control training. So we didn't want to spoil the task at hand, but we did want to maximise enjoyment and engagement. So we ran another systematic review and we've just finished that one. We found 1,500 articles and particularly after the uh, full text screening, 18 of those um, told us what needed to be in a gamified task to increase motivation and engagement with training. Um, the, we All of those 18 studies trained either shifting inhibition or working memory. So they did have to be using the targeted training that we were talking about. 
and we found game elements like using a narrative, allowing the young person to be a character in a story, offering rewards but in the form of tokens, um, also other encouragers like external rewards, um, uh, being able to deliver it on a tablet, an iPhone or a computer. Um, the sort of the four weeks was about the sweet spot of the number of sessions. And also we looked at um, whether or not we should rely on self-report of the young person or also teacher-parent um, ratings of anxiety pre and post. So this is where we're heading. We're in the process of um, going back to our original study. Um, obviously, we won't uh, add the data together because we've are in the process of developing a gamified version of the Passat with many of those game elements. Um, we also need to gamify the one back. So the control group will also do um, a gamified version. And we've recently been funded by the Spencer Foundation, which is a US um, education focused grant. And we're looking at a gamified go, no go, which is inhibitory control training um, with uh, children and we're also going to measure changes in their maths performance. So we chose maths because the ability to inhibit um, a prepotent response is critical to being able to do well at maths achievement at a primary level. I thought I'd include this slide and I'm happy to share my slides, um, but this is um, some tips. We often get people at the end of a, a talk to ask about how do we manage anxiety in our own children or in our children in our classroom. So I've included that slide for you, which was a recent um, article in the conversation. And I'm just going to see where I'm up to for time, but um, deal a couple of minutes to talk about the Journal of Psychologists and Counselors in Schools. We're really excited. We're moving to SAGE. We've been a journal, as Marilyn said, we, we have been a couple of other names in the past, but we've been going for 35 years and we're really excited to join SAGE where we're going to have four issues a year as of next year. SAGE have dutifully set us up a submission link already. Um, so we're going to hit the ground running with our first issue in March next year. Um, our articles, we're happy to accept theory, practical, professional and training related topics of interest to uh, psychology, counselling and guidance and career guidance in K to 12 schools. So you will get a, an email from me saying we're not interested if you are um, providing me data on university students because we're just um, talking about primary, middle and secondary schools. Um, we accept original articles, reviews, applied practices, papers, which are less rigorous, and also book reviews. So I might leave it there and see if I've got a couple of minutes left if anyone's got any questions. Uh, thank you, Liv. And there is a question on the question board is about, uh, as you can see in the slide. I can, yeah. What to do if a student is advised uh, to, ref excuse me, refer to a trained professional, but the parent guardian is unwilling or not cooperating. That's always a difficult one, irrespective of what the condition is. Um, I guess um, when I was a school psychologist, it I was always, sure to build that um, relationship with a parent, um, that trust and and that, I guess, um, uh, willingness for them because we have the same overarching goal, which is the, the well-being and the happiness of their young person. So my advice would be to find out why the parent is unwilling or not cooperating um, and if there was anything I could do to regain that trust. Um, I, I used to have a colleague that would talk about a patient in a pocket 
it's just a funny expression, but sometimes I would say, I would pull out a patient in a pocket and say, look, I um, I worked with a, a young child recently or last year who was very similar to yourself, didn't want to um, start any type of therapy and let me tell you what happened and you tell us sort of a success story um, and that's the patient in the pocket. Um, so, yes, they, they are a real... Um, case that you've worked with but you could um explain that you know it, it had a, a much more positive result than letting it go unattended what would be your best personal advice in terms of therapeutic approach management for families who are struggling with children suffering from a physical disability with anxiety um, this is where I guess mental health is that complexity. You haven't just got one issue and I wouldn't be surprised if that was a little bit com comorbid, anxiety and depression um, with a student with disability. Um, there are, you can go to some of those tips in the article that I had there because many of those are for families. Um, but I guess there are many associations. I'm not sure where you're from, that person, but lots of times there might be a deaf association or a vision impaired association who can provide you with some guidance around the specific needs of that young person in the presence of anxiety. Otherwise, you're, um, yeah, I can remember working with a young lady who was hearing impaired um, and we did, basically, we did a lot of visual tasks in the, the therapy approach. Um, you know, she was following me in terms of what I was doing with my mindfulness activities and that sort of thing. So it's many of the strategies are still accessible from people, but if you need further guidance, the, I would direct you to those wonderful community organisations for those disability groups. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for uh, sharing and explanations. So uh, let's come to the next session. Thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, we welcome Do Dr. Wendy Lee, the Associate Editor of Journal of Pacific Rim Psychology. And this journal is published on behalf of Beijing Normal University. Dr. Wendy Lee is also an Associate Professor of Psychology and Associate Dean for research in College of Healthcare Science at James Cook University. Professor Lee is the founding chair of the Aus Asia Mental Health Research Group. She founds and leads the Mindfulness Lab at GCU. Professor Lee has published extensively in the research field of mental health, aging, migration, and problem gambling. She also collaborates with researchers in China on research into Chinese mental health through her appointment of an adjunct Professor of Shanxi University and Taiyuan Psychiatric Hospital. Please go ahead, Dr. Lee. Okay, I was muted, sorry for that. Thank you so much. And also thank you so much for my uh, co-presenters for the wonderful presentations. Uh, maybe my presentation will add some answers to the previous uh, presentation. And I am the associate editor for the Journal of Pacific Rim Psychology as introduced previously, that this is a uh, journal owned by Beijing Normal University, published by SAGE. And one of the important thing I would like to emphasize is this is an open access journal, but without article processing charge, which means you can uh, save a couple of thousand bucks uh, to publish in an open access journal. And for this journal, don't be uh, afraid by the name Journal of Pacific Rim Psychology, we actually move beyond the original regional focus to uh, the worldwide. And also the focus is pretty uh, broad. And the impact factor of our journal in 2022 is 2.3, year impact factor is 2.1. So yeah, please think about to submit your uh, articles to our journal. Thank you so much.
And in this study, uh, pandemic seems to be very from uh, psychologically, but uh, maybe it still have lots of implication for us in terms of maintaining uh, mental health during a public crisis. So this presentation, I will include three studies we conducted uh, during the pandemic period and with Chinese participants. Study one is with Chinese university stud uh, students. It's a longitudinal study. And study two, study three are cross-sessional uh, study. I will go through the details in each study. Uh, study one, we look at novelty seeking and mental health in Chinese university students before, during, and after the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. So the study, we have three time, uh, three timelines. I will talk about that later. And novelty seeking is, uh, it's a concept referring to the tendency to have an open and curiosity to one situation and actively interact with and adapt to the changes in one's environment, for example, during the pandemic. And generally speaking, individuals with high level of novelty seeking often explore novel and unfamiliar situation and environment which may enhance the creativity of individual to solve the problem in a way that allows them to adjust uh, their emotional responses to stressful situations such as in the lock during the lockdown of the pandemic. And in our studies, we use the subscale in uh, the Langer mindfulness scale, uh, the novelty seeking just five items. And this is the table I would like to present, but I will not go into details. I circle a couple of uh, a couple of values so that you can see the novelty seeking in three time points and negatively related to stress, anxiety, and depression which means the higher level of novelty seeking, the lower level of anxiety, stress, and depression. And this is the longitudinal analysis. It's quite interesting because the time one, as you can see, is in November, 2019, we conducted a research project in China regarding mental health among university students. But as normal for researchers, after we collect the data, the data just quietly sit on my computer. But when the pandemic, particularly the uh, pandemic uh, first occurred in China, so I suddenly realized actually we have a, a data collection in November 2019. So I fished out the data and questionnaire. Then we did the second one in February and March. That's one month into the pandemic and lockdown as well in China. And then we measure three months later, May and June, uh, from May to June 2020. And that's the three. So we published the paper quite early in during the pandemic in uh, 2020. As you can see, it's very interesting. Actually, in time two, the peak of the pandemic and also at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone everyone's panicking. But actually the mental health uh, indicators, for example, anxiety, uh, depression, and stress were lower than those in before the pandemic. And but uh, novelty seeking is at the highest level. The gray line is at the highest level and maintain the same level. But after three months, uh, the mental health indicators are going up again. Actually, we conducted this, uh, this research for 10 times. And every three months, we measure again. So our uh, the uh, 10 wave longitudinal study results will be published in Sage Open, yeah, hopefully uh, next month or the, the month after next month. This is the study one. And we have study two looking at mental health of Chinese people during the pandemic, association with the infection severity of region of residence and filial piety. And this is something we are interested to see whether the cultural resources, video piety is a protective uh, factor for 
uh, Chinese people's mental health during the pandemic. And filial piety refers to uh, moral norms and practices of respect and caring for our parents. Not only does it require filial duties such as material and emotional support to our parents as uh, do in the Western cultures, but it's also required to, for example, co-residents with our parents and also compliance and obedience to our parents, our, uh, the parental, de parental demands. And this is very uh, important because this is a hierarchy structure of authority within the family unit. A tree can be extended beyond the household and apply to the authority relations in the society, for example, with the government. And during the pandemic, uh, situation, this is rather important, which means whether the people comply, uh, comply and obey the social uh, isolation and lockdown as well. And so the filial piety was measured by a dual factor model of filial piety, consistent reciprocal filial piety, authoritarian filial piety, and for mental distress, we use uh, the Chinese version of death and the infection severity in the region of residents. We use the number of confirmed cases and deaths in the area of the participant reside on April 16, 2020. So we actually have three groups. One is the severe infected group. That's the people, the participants within Wuhan city and the moderate infected group is the uh, people in uh, Hubei province excluded Wuhan city because Wuhan city belongs to uh, Hub uh, Hubei province and elsewhere in China. So what we found, we found that the I circle and we have 1,201 participants one, from 107 cities in China and the data collection was from April to June, 2020. And I circled the correlations, as you can see, both filial piety uh, negatively related to, uh, except the stress, related to uh, stress, anxiety, and depression, which means the higher level of filial piety associated lower level of mental distress. And this is the prevalence, as we can see, and as expected, uh, the prevalence of stress, anxiety, and depression in highest infection uh, severity group, of course, higher than uh, other groups. And we would like to see whether, uh, for example, we understand filial piety is negatively associated with mental distress. So we, we hypothesize that it will work for lower infection area. And, but when the infection is very high and people's very, very worried, then maybe filial piety would not work at all. But very interesting, actually we found the uh, negative association between filial piety and mental distress was very similar across three groups, which means even for participants in high uh, infection severity uh, area and filial piety still, the higher level of filial piety still uh, related to lower level of mental distress. And also we extend this uh, research to look at across cultural situations. So we have Chinese, participants, Australian participants, and also Indian participants, it was very encouraging because we found filial piety actually is also negatively correlated to uh, mental distress for Indian participants and Australian participants, although filial piety is a Chinese concept in origins. In study three, we use the same data set as study two, to look at the relationship between mindfulness and mental distress of the 1,200 people, to look at 
whether infection severity of regions uh, is a moderator and whether resilience and self-efficacy is a mediator for the relationship between mindfulness and mental distress. Uh, as you may know, mindfulness has been found as a protective uh, factor for mental health. It refers to the awareness that emer emer emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and not non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. And resilient have yeah, different uh, conceptualization, but regardless whether it's a trait or an outcome or a process, it's about bounce back, whether we can bounce back after facing or in the face of adversity, and self-efficacy refers that our belief, whether we have the capacity to change, whether we have the capacity uh, to perform a specific behavior uh, during uh, this uh, in different situations. So we would like to look at those three variables. And the severity of infection and mental distraction is this, uh, were the same uh, as the study too. And from mindfulness, we use the Chinese version of language mindfulness scale, resilient, we use the Chinese version of CDRSRSC, and self-efficacy, we use the Chinese general self-efficacy scale. And what we found, and again, I circle the correlations as we can see, uh, Mindfulness negatively correlated to stress, anxiety, and depression, and resilience negatively correlated to uh, those three mental health indicators as well. It's the same, uh, it's similar for self efficacy, which means the higher level of mindfulness, resilience, self efficacy are uh, correlated to lower level of mental distress, for example, stress, anxiety, and depression. Again, we use the same model as the previous study, looking at whether mindfulness, uh, the correct, a negative correlation between mindfulness and mental distress will work in the high infected area. Our assumption was that for people living in low or moderate uh, infected area, mindfulness may help them maintain their mental health but when the infection and worry is uh, out of the roof, maybe it will not work. And but it's the same as the uh, previous study regarding filial piety. We found there is no significant interaction between mindfulness and infection severity uh, in terms of the impact, the effect on mental distress, which means mindfulness, the uh, the higher level of mindfulness related to lower level of stress, anxiety, and depression is very similar across three uh, infection group. Even for people living in high infected area, mindfulness is still helpful to uh, for maintaining mental health. And also we would like to understand what's the underlying mechanism between the relationship of mindfulness and stress or other uh, other indicator, mental health indicator. I just use stress as an example. So we found the higher level of mindfulness related to higher level of resilience and self-efficacy in turn related to lower level of stress, anxiety, and depression, which means that uh, resilient and self-efficacy uh, were the uh, mediator underlying the relationship between men, uh, mindfulness and stress. So these are the findings of our start, uh, three studies. And we also uh, analyzed the data in our cross-cultural uh, analysis uh, study and found very similar that uh, mindfulness uh, are protective factors for mental distraction across three countries, for example, China, India, and Australia. So what we learned from the three studies, 
And in the cross-sectional studies, as I said, negative association between uh, filial piety and mental distraction was relevant. Uh, relative consistent across the three infection severity regions in China during the pandemic. And also mindfulness, resilience, and self-efficacy were found to be negatively associated with the mental dis uh, stress indicators and negative association between filial piety, mindfulness, and mental distress has been found consistent across mild, moderate, and severe COVID-19 infection areas. And also resilient self-efficacy were found to mediate the negative relationship between mindfulness and mental distress. And in the longitudinal study, greater novelty seeking was associated with lower level of stress, anxiety, and depression. And then the growth tra trajectory for novelty seeking was negatively associated with the growth trajectory for the mental, uh, indi mental health indicators. So for the founding of these studies indicate the importance of the role uh, positive psychological uh, resources play in responding to pandemic, particularly in future pandemic, maybe we would like to include those factors in to prepare for the future pandemic. It may be possible for future public health measures to inco incorporate the promotions of the positive psychological so resources to help individuals respond to stressful situations and maintain good mental health in the face of future public crisis. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, thank you, Wendy. And here is a question for you. I am currently doing research on mental health of older adults in urban heat. In particular, I struggle with data collection. My teacher said that I can only use open-ended questions for interviews and cannot set them as closed question for quantification. So currently, my research method are only qualitative research interviews with discussions, but I feel only qualitative may not be subject, may be too subjective. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure why your professor suggests you only use open-ended questions for interviews. And I think, I'm not sure your uh, sample size, maybe your sample size is too small to use the uh, quantitative method. And so if your sample size is big enough, then I think a mixed method would be yeah, very useful so that you understand the, uh, the data quantitatively and also understand uh, the nuanced experience of the participants. I think it largely depends on your sample size. Any other questions? Oh, thank you, Wendy. Thanks for your explanation. And I think that's the only question for you. So we will come to the next section. We'll uh, welcome Dr. Marilyn Campbell, the professor in the Faculty of Creative Industries, Education and Social Justice at, at Queensland University of Technology. And uh, Marilyn has worked as a teacher and psychologist in early childhood primary and secondary schools. Her research interests are in behavioral and emotional problems in children and adolescents. Her recent work has included research into anxiety prevention and intervention, as well as the effect of bullying and especially cyberbullying in schools. And please go ahead. Thank you. What I'd like you to do at the moment is, can you just close your eyes for a moment? And what picture of a bully comes into your mind? Now, I'd like you to open your eyes and look at the picture. 
Did it look like this? Was it a boy? Did it look like a thug? It's really interesting, isn't it? Because we have these stereotypes of what a person who is bullying might look like. But we also know that girls bully just as much as boys and that physical bullying is not the only type of bullying. We can't actually tell what behaviour a student has by looking at them. But there are many stereotypes about bullies, about many half-truths and myths. And my name is Marilyn. I'm here to talk about the mental health of students who bully and how to help them. I think most of us would like to see less aggression in the world, especially at the moment. I think most of us would also like to see less aggression in schools. We need to consider the needs of students who bully, understand their mental health and help them, similar to any other child who has problematic behaviour. In fact, we need to reduce bullying in our schools, maintain positive relationships, and improve our understanding of students who bully others and improve our ways of helping them. Now, some of you might be thinking, these students don't deserve help. They're hurting others. Actually, they do need help in changing their behaviour. As I was kindly introduced, I'm a professor of educational psychology at the Queensland University of Technology. My research areas of expertise are anxiety in children and bullying in young people. I've been a teacher both in early childhood, in primary and in secondary, and a school psychologist or counsellor. And I think we are not concentrating enough of our scarce resources on those young people who bully others. So let's discuss what could be the barriers to helping these young people change their behaviour, and how might we overcome them? First of all, we have to overcome a lot of prejudice about that schools should just punish these students because they're naughty. They should then stop bullying. They don't actually deserve our help. And barrier two is that these students get so many rewards from bullying, they actually don't want to stop. They don't want our help. So to overcome these barriers, I suggest three things. We know that three quarters or more of schools in various countries actually always have sanctions or punishments if a student has found to be bullying. And most adults actually think it is actually unacceptable behaviour. It's morally indefensible that there is no excuse for students bullying. So this should lead just to very strict punishment. However, we also know that bullying is not reducing. So why would schools continue to do the same thing and expect a different result? Obviously, punishment might be a necessary component, but it is obviously not sufficient. At one of the high schools that I worked at, there was a, a year 11 boy who was mercilessly bullying a year nine student. So the school did what they did with the sanctions and suspended him. And each time that happened, his mother took him out for lunch. Needless to say, this punishment 
of not being allowed to go to school uh, did not work and the student continued bullying. But the problem is that punishment works sometimes. As we said at the beginning, all students are different. For example, one of the children that I worked with was in year seven, the first year of high school. And she saw this wonderful girl bullying others and wanted to be just as popular as she was. So she started trying out a lot of bullying behaviours. She hadn't bullied in primary school. She was just thinking, hmm, maybe this is a good behaviour for me to be able to do to get friends. She was easily found out by the school and when confronted with it, was very remorseful, was punished. Her parents were told, who were absolutely horrified, and yes, she didn't bully again. However, that isn't the case with a lot of students who actually go on to be persistent uh, people who bully others. The second thing, which is I try to point out to schools, is they often have anti-bullying um, programs. This particular site had 23 anti-bullying programs. And often these programs are not evidence-based. And what happens is that even if they are evidence-based, we know that they, the programs, even though they have reduced the victimization, they only very slightly reduce the perpetrators. The figures are about like 20 percent of reduction of students who are victimized, but only about 10 percent of students who who bully. Now this is similar with Kiva, one of the most um, researched anti-bullying programs in the world. Also, it, the same happens with the Friendly Schools Program, the Albeas Bullying Program, and the Peace Pack. A very recent study published this year has actually shown Kiva in um, the United Kingdom in a randomized control trial uh, reduced the number of kids who are being victimized but did nothing for the perpetrators. So while the programs are evidence-based, if they're implemented with fidelity, which is often a problem, they're reducing the number of kids who are being victimized. So what, what does that mean? It means that those children who are being victimized are being victimized even more. The third thing that we can do to actually tell schools that we need to help these children who do carry out bullying behaviours is to explain to them the mental health of these children. And these are both short-term and also long-term consequences. So we have uh, mental health problems such as anxiety in those children who bully. They have depression. They abuse substances. And they have suicidal ideation and sometimes attempts. Long-term studies, longitudinal studies, have actually shown that the children who perpetually bully at school binge drink in adulthood. They are more likely to be involved in criminal activity and they are more likely to perpetrate violence. We know that domestic violence is a severe form of bullying with aggression, that's intended to hurt repeatedly with an imbalance of power. So 
if we tell schools these three things, punishment isn't working for everyone, that the programs aren't reducing the number of kids who are bullying, and that the mental health of these children needs looking after, what do we do for the second barrier? These children are getting what they want from bullying. Why would they want to stop it? So what can we do as school counsellors and psychologists? Some of the things that we are already doing, and a lot of people, including a lot of politicians, are mediation is the way to go. For me, I would definitely advise against it. Mediation is to solve conflict between two people who want the conflict to stop. I am sure that putting a person who I am scared of, who is bullying me and I can't get them to stop, I am not going to be able to shake their hand, even if they say sorry. The imbalance of power should not be, uh, should be the reason that this method should not be used. Similarly, uh, the method of shared concern is often promulgated to assist a, a person who has been bullying. However, again, this is very similar where an adult takes control of the whole group and the person who is being victimised, who cannot get this to stop, is subjected to part, uh, to being part of the solution when they should not be. Even restorative justice, which is great for conflict between students should not be used, I believe, for looking at trying to change the behaviour of these students who bully. So what should we do? One of the things that looks very promising is motivational interviewing by counsellors who are trained in this method. And we know that motivational interviewing has been used with adolescents and it's also um, mainly been used with people with an addiction. So if you're addicted to drugs, then you're often problematic about that behaviour, like drugs are great, they make me feel terrific, I love taking them, uh, but on the other hand, I don't have the money for it, which means I've got to go out and steal, and then I get punished for that. Uh, I, I'm just in two minds. I kind of want to give up, but I kind of don't. If you can have that conversation with those students who actually are bullying, then perhaps we could have this relational conversation with them to overcome their ambivalence. Oh, I don't like it if I get caught. There are some kids who really don't like me, but hey, I, this is the way that I get my jollies or this is the way that I feel accepted in my group. So, in summary, bullying is still an unresolved problem in our schools. We need to convince schools that punishment and their programs are not sufficient to change these students' behaviour. We need to convince schools that the students who bully frequently have poor mental health. And we as psychologists and counsellors need to explore more efficacious treatment for helping these children to change their behaviour so that they don't suffer those short and long-term negative consequences. So now for a time for a, a few questions. For example, you might want to know more about motivational interviewing or about anti-bullying uh, programs. Who would like to start to ask a question?
So the question is, can a student's persistent belief be having to attribute possible development of having conduct disorder? Um, persistent bullying behaviour is an antisocial behaviour and therefore can form part of a conduct disorder. Um, I don't think that saying that they have conduct disorder then will lead to bullying behaviour. How can we effectively convince schools and administrators that have a too traditional mindset to adopt much more evidence-based interview interventions for bullying? Well, first, the interventions for bullying that are evidence-based, as I have said, uh, only reduce those victimizations by 20%, um, which isn't a great lot. Um, and they only reduce perpetration by half that amount. I actually don't think, um, yes, evidence-based interventions um, for bullying will be great if the programs were there, but we don't have enough research, even after 50 years of looking at bullying behaviour. There is still no magic bullet. There is no, well, this is what schools should do. It is such a complex social relationships problem that is deeply embedded in our society because it's not just kids who do it, but we really need to try and find some innovative and new ways. And for me, my thinking at the moment is to not to uh, have these universal programs all the time, but to use our scarce resources to target those children who are at most risk, and that is those who are bullying persistently. I think that, um, I hope that answers the question. If we don't help these students, bullying will continue. When we do help them, bullying will reduce. If we all work together, we can overcome the barriers and hopefully change their behaviour. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn. Um, so at time limits, we are not able to answer all the questions. There are still some of the questions on the chatting board. And um, so now we will turn to Dr. Li Ming Tian, the senior managing editor from Sage Publishing. And Dr. Tian had worked as an editor for a portfolio of biology and medicine journals for over six years. And she is well experienced in manuscript editing and peer review. As an author, Dr. Tian published more than 40 journal papers with a citation of over 2,400 and an H index of 27. Hi, good afternoon. And uh, good morning, good evening, everyone, depends on where you are. And uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Candice. And uh, I have really enjoyed the presentations from the previous four speakers, uh, really interesting topics and uh, stimulate a lot of thinkings uh, around. And uh, for the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes, I will share with you around the topic uh, about uh, how to maximize your research impact from submission to publication and beyond. And uh, here is the outline of today's talk, along with the submission process from before submission to during submission and to post the publication stage. I will discuss how we can maximize the research impact of our research. So let's get started from the uh, before submission stage. So when we uh, have our study ready and uh, uh, we, the the I think the question for us for the uh, at the beginning is we have so many choices of journals and uh, how can we choose the right journal and uh, the best suitable journals for our work? Here I just uh, give some numbers as example. There are over twenty one thousand and five hundred journals indexed in the journal citation reports, and uh, within those journals. There are over 9,500 journals uh, <clears throat> in the Science Citation Index, the Index Expanded, that's a so-called ICI journal. And uh, 
even we uh, narrow these <coughs> numbers uh, down further to the most relevant the disciplines <clears throat> to today's audience, to the psychiatry and the psychology, there are still more than uh, 1,500 journals. Even we look at the journals with one publisher, for example, at Sage, we still have more than 80 journals relevant to psychology and uh, psychiatry disciplines. So how can we choose the best journal for our research? And uh, here I summarized the, the <clears throat> uh, top I think considerations most authors would consider when choosing a journals. Okay, let's first uh, start with the scope of, uh, of the journal. So the journal's aim and the scope is the first thing you should consider. A common reason for reject is the work is out of scope of the journal. This is also one of the most frequent reasons I have seen for the journals I work on. First, please make sure you choose the journal whose scope match your paper. For example, some journal might consider uh, only publish clinical work. Then if you have a work focused on preclinical translational study, it will be not suitable for that journal. Second, you should also consider the audience of the journal, whether they would be interested in your work. Next uh, is the quality threshold of a journal. So about the journal's quality threshold, first understand the journal, whether the journal is a highly selective journal uh, or a less selective journal, or a journal aiming to publish some science without seeking high novelty and broad interest. Uh, for sure, everyone wants to publish uh, their paper in the best possible journal, but depends on the situation. And I think this is something you need to have a balance on. Are you under the pressure to publish your work as soon as possible? And are you willing to take the risk that your paper might be rejected? Aiming too high might result in rejection and the whole publication process, as you can imagine, will take longer. So be realistic. However, if you have time, you can aim as high as possible. Uh, journals impact. So. You can get uh, an idea of a journal's impact by many different angles. The first and the most familiar one is uh, journal's uh, impact factor. So here are some questions you might ask yourself. Does the journal has, uh, have an F? Whether the F is high enough to meet your needs? Uh, however, please note that uh, uh, impact factor we usually talk about is the one released by Clarivate every year by end of June. Clarivate will release new impact factors for the journals indexed in their database. Some journals might show their impact factor information in their journal website, but however, it's not the official ones we refer to. Please watch out for those lookalikes. The second thing I want to highlight here is even impact factor <clears throat> could reflect the impact of the journal, but in but actually impact factor is not equal to the quality of the journal. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Second, whether the journal has a global visibility or is more a regional journal with targeted audience in a specific region. And the third, whether the journal is indexed in the major abstracting and indexing services, for example, PMC, Scopus, uh, ICIE in indexing in those major abstracting and indexing database is a good indication of the journal's high quality and the global visibility. The journal's publishing mode. So there are various uh, publishing mode for a journal. So traditional subscription journal for accessing and reading the four articles, you have to access it from your library access if your library has subscription. Otherwise, you may not be able to read the full article. Open access journal. Uh, once published, it will be available online to everyone for free. You can access the full article anytime and anywhere with internet access. As you can imagine, articles published as OA would have more visibility. And also sometimes publishing in an OA journal uh, might be mandated by your funder. So the journal 
might also be a hybrid journal with open access options where you can choose to publish your article either in the traditional mode or open access. <clears throat> Peer review time of the journal. So how quickly you would like to publish your paper also is very important for you as author. You can find the journal's turnaround time. Uh, for example, time to first decision, time to accept where the journal's website or by checking the published papers. Uh, some journal in their published paper, the information of the submission date and the accepted date appear along with the article. For gold OA journals, um, Typically, OA, a gold OA journal have a shorter time from accept to publication because uh, those journals publish in a continuous mode. Paper is published once it's accepted without waiting and collecting all papers in the issue before the whole issue can be published. Uh, phase associated with submission and the publication process. So for choosing a journal, uh, I think whether there are any phase occurred is also important for the authors. And please make sure your funding could cover the cost. Possible phase including article processing charges as APC, which is associated with open access publishing and uh, it will be charged if your manuscript is accepted and published. Some journal might also charge a, a face based on the page, that's the page charge. Uh, also, sometimes might get confused about the difference between the face occurred. Uh, here is a blog wrote by a senior editor at the stage. And uh, if you are interested, you can look at it uh, at our Sage Perspective blog. And uh, we have discussed uh, the uh, different factors, including scope, quality, threshold, impact, publishing mode, speed of peer review, and uh, article processing charge, uh, and uh, the rele relevant phase. And uh, on top of this, please talk to your colleagues about the their experience with the journals, uh, it, uh, it would be really helpful. When I was still a junior a PhD student and started my first uh, submission process, I really got a lot of useful tips from my senior colleagues in my lab. I think that's a good way. And uh, last but not least, absolutely, please avoid journals with no clear submission and reviewing process. Uh, which might be predatory journals, which we definitely would not want to publish our work with. And uh, actually, journals' uh, official website is a very resourceful uh, place where we can find a lot of information uh, for choosing a journal. For example, here is a journal website of the Journal of International Medical Research, so from its website, we can get the information of its impact factor and also the full text usage for the previous years. So the full, te uh, full text usage for this journal for last year is more than 1 million and 800,000, which is quite impressive. This journal is also uh, indexed by uh, a lot of abstracting and indexing databases, including the major ones like uh, ICIE, uh, Medline, and Scopus, uh, which indicates this is a journal with good quality and uh, global international uh, visibilities. Yeah, so let's move to <clears throat> write uh, effective title and abstract. So why is worth our uh, worth us spending more time in carefully writing the title abstract and choosing keywords? This is because majority of people will only read your title and the abstract. Uh, for example, during the peer review process, <clears throat> editors will only send out the title and the abstract to invited reviewers, and the reviewers decide whether they would spend more time in reading the full article and providing a review report. I always see that the reviewer declines to review <clears throat> And they state that abstract indicates poor quality of the submission. So a well 
written title and abstract could potentially facilitate the peer review process. For post-publication stage, readers get to, to know your article by searches of keywords. They read the abstract for most of the time and will only read the full article if they find anything relevant and interesting from the abstract. <clears throat> Here are some general rules to write title and uh, abstract. So the title should be concise, simple, and uh, informative. And the title must reflect the content of the paper. And uh, please avoid uh, uncommon abbreviations in the title. And uh, please do not make spelling mistakes in the title. <clears throat> For abstract, uh, the abstract should include the background methods, a uh, summary of key results and concise uh, conclusions. Abstract could be structured or unstructured based on the <clears throat> journal's style and the article type. Uh, in the abstract, normally do not uh, include a discussion of the existing literature and uh, do not include uh, abbreviations, lots of technical details or references, and uh, we would recommend you to write the abstract last. <clears throat> so other than the general rules here, I want to provide some uh, additional tips to help readers find your article. So for the title, please include uh, the main, the key phrases for your topic and uh, try to use a descriptive title because this uh, descriptive title is good for making an article more searchable in Madeline and Web of Science. So for keywords, please include the three to four key phrases as the keywords and, and another three to four additional phrases as keywords. And in cases where more than one phrase abbreviations are used to describe the same thing, for example, for a drug name, please include both or all variant for those cases. So for the abstract, actually abstract is not only the sales pitch that tempts readers to read into the full article, it's also the information that gives the search engine all the data it needs to be able to find your article and rank it in the search results page. And here are some tips. Please try to repeat the key descriptive phrases in the abstract, but please note Google can detect uh, <clears throat> abuse of this, so don't overplay it. Just focus on just uh, three to four key phrases in your abstract. And uh, here are uh, two examples of how your article would look like at PubMed. As you can see, only the title, uh, abstract, and keywords, and some uh, figures are uh, available in the PubMed search. <clears throat> Let's move on to the during submission stage. So during submissions, uh, I think uh, you might get a question from the peer review system to ask you whether you will uh, you are submitting your uh, <clears throat> manuscript to a special collection. So what is a special collection and uh, why should you submit to, to a special collection? Here I will give the answer. So, uh, actually, there are different names, uh, but basically they mean the same thing. For example, special collections, special issues, or seem the issues uh, different. I think based on the publisher or journals, they might have different names, but uh, they are just uh, so uh, they are spe as special collections. They are focused on the specific topic area and include leading edge research in a given domain. And uh, so why should we submit to a special collection if our research is relevant to the topic of the special collection? That's, uh, there are many benefits associated with publishing with a special issue. Uh, for example, uh, special issue publications normally has increased visibility and with strong potential to support usage and citation activities. Uh, also, special collection articles has fast publication process. I think there has been 
various evidence showing that uh, special content articles attract uh, more citations in the first 24 months than articles published in a regular issue. And at the stage, we uh, have a very reputable special collection programs. And uh, here are some feedback from our editors. <clears throat> and uh, our special collection, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> program allows us to bring in just editors, but also provides opportunities for clinicians and the researchers earlier in their career to write and publish in a strong journal that is aimed at the audience they want to reach. Yeah. <clears throat> Next the one is about uh, ORCID ID. And uh, I think uh, during submission process, you might be asked to provide ORCID ID for the authors. And uh, so ORCID ID is the open researcher and the contributor ID. And why should you use <clears throat> ORCID ID is because ORCID ID can have many benefits. Uh, for example, it can distinguish yourself from every other contributor, even those who share your name. And uh, ORCID ID can maintain all <clears throat> of your key information in one place. And the ORCID ID is supported by major research organizations, founders, societies, and the publishers. And <clears throat> it's quite convenient, only takes seconds to associate your ORCID with any accounts on your online peer review platform. I think nowadays for most of the state journals, uh, ORCID ID is required. Otherwise, the authors can't complete the submission process and you are encouraged to register and have an ORCID ID if you haven't done so. <clears throat> and then let's move on to the post publication stage. Congratulations, your paper is accepted and published. And uh, now definitely it's not the end of the journey. Actually, it's a fresh start when you can start uh, actively promoting your articles. <clears throat> There are various ways you can promote your articles post-publication, including social media, blogging, conferences, presentations, and uh, various academic promotion websites. <clears throat> so first, uh, uh, social media. So if you are active on social media platforms, telling your followers about your article is one of the simplest and the most uh, effective things you can do. Uh, there are some popular social media platforms, for example, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, WeChat. You might prefer one to another, depends on your research community and where you are. For example, I'm based in China and I use WeChat more than any other social media platforms. And it's not necessary to use all the social media platforms and just use the one you already are active on and familiar with. And uh, some general guidelines for using social media include try to use more images and videos, which uh, would be more interactive with the audience and uh, link, your art uh, link to your articles uh, in the post and uh, try to use common hashtags, uh, which would increase the visibility of the <clears throat> social media content. And uh, blog posting, blog, Blogging is another good way to promote your articles. At the stage, we have Sage uh, Perspective blog. So it covers uh, topics from topical research across a wide uh, variety of disciplines. And uh, the considerations before pitching a blog post, uh, there are several questions you can ask yourself. For example, is the research timely relevant to the current events? Is the paper presenting new, exciting, or significant findings? Does the paper explain complex issues? And uh, is the paper recent, ideally published within the last 12 months? So if all the answers to the above questions are yes, I think you might uh, submit a pitch using a form available in our Sage uh, Author Gateway. And uh, 
probably your uh, your blog can be published at our seed perspective blog. And uh, conference uh, is uh, a good way to promote your articles to conference attendees are the most relevant persons uh, to your research, I think. Uh, so if you got a chance, you get a chance to do presentations during conference, please end the slide to end of your presentations, referencing your article and the journal in which it's published, including the link so conference attendees can find your article easily. Academic uh, promotion websites. So those websites uh, all exist to raise the profile of academics and their published work, all give excellent guidance on how you can promote your work and all of them are free. Uh, okay, that we discussed uh, a few minutes ago and uh, for Web of Science profile, so this was Pablo previously and now it's part of Clarivate. So being on this international citation network makes your work more discoverable. And also we uh, we also recommend kudos and the conversations as academic promotion websites. And uh, at the end, I would like to recommend a few relevant state journals, uh, clinical child psychology and psychiatry, therapeutic advances in psychopharmacology, eye perception, journal of international medical research, Evolutionary Psychology, Journal of Ex Experimental Psychopathology. I want to give a bit more details on the Journal of International Medical Research. <clears throat> so this is a broad scope medicine journal, which also welcomes research from psychology and psychiatry. Once the paper is accepted, the journal provides several technical and language editing services without extra cost. Due to this reason, this journal is really liked by many authors whose first language is not English. Also, I want to recommend those two uh, journals, Big Data and the Society. <clears throat> so this uh, journal uh, publishes interdisciplinary work, principally in the social sciences, humanities, and the computing. <clears throat> and their intersections with arts and natural science about the implication of big data for society. And the stage open publishes articles may span the full spectrum of the social and behavioral sciences and humanities. Yeah, that's all for my talk today. Thank you so much. And uh, we meet in the Q and A session. Uh, thank you, Lenin. And I think there are uh, two questions. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, so first the question is, which site we can access article CC's journals for free? where we can use uh, as reference for our CC, thank you. So uh, I think uh, for accessing and reading the four articles, it really depends on the publishing mode, like uh, just mentioned uh, in the presentations. If the journal is a traditional subscription journal, you can uh, only get to read the four article if your library has subscriptions. Uh, or if that's the open access journal, you can get the full article without any uh, restrictions. Yeah. So it really depends on uh, so which journals the papers are published with. Yeah. And the second question is how much is the fee in publishing the journal? So this is also, uh, I think, a quite a big question. The answer is not it's not really a simple a simple answer it depends on the publishing mode of the journal for example uh, for traditional subscription journals the authors doesn't need to pay 
for public uh, for publications, but for gold open access journals, normally there is a, a cost called uh, article processing charges. So once the article is accepted, the authors will need to pay a one-time uh, article processing charge. But the price, I think, uh, varies based on the journals. Um, yeah. But at Sage, we provide different support to our authors. Uh, either I think as authors can get a discount through their institutional deals. I think uh, my colleagues later will introduce this more. Yeah. And one more question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I see that. So. A beginner researcher would think that sub submitting manuscript would be a problem unless they include senior researcher as a correspondent. Is this wrong? Is this right? So um, I, uh, so that's a quite a good question, but it's not necessary to include a senior researcher uh, in your author list. And uh, uh, actually, I would uh, recommend, uh, suggest the authors to read uh, the guidelines from COPE about uh, authorship, who qualified as the authors and follow the guidelines. Uh, so to be qualified as an author, I think uh, the person must make sufficient uh, contribution to the study design, the data interpretation, the writing, and take the responsibilities for the research integrity. Yeah, so it's not necessarily to include uh, a senior researcher, especially if the person is not really getting involved with your work, yeah. Well, thank you, Lini. Uh, so let's go to the next part. And finally, we will invite Halima Ibrahim, our partner success executive for open access to introduce about Sage open access. Okay, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, okay, let me just put my screen. Okay, so my name is Halima and uh, can this mention I'm the Partner Success Executive for Open Access at, at Sage. And I'll just quickly be sharing about Sage Open Access offerings, uh, publishing open access with Sage as well as the call transformative agreement for the ANZ market. Yeah. So open access is not something new to Sage uh, as part of our commitment to building bridges to knowledge um, and to support the development of ideas and to empower um, researchers, librarians, and readers. We uh, Sage has actually spent more than a decade in, th in this area and we've played a very active role. So we have a few offerings um, under the OA model. So we have the go route or Gold Open Access and articles that are published under the Gold, uh, Gold Open Access uh, enjoy worldwide um, publication immediately. Um, and there's, it's barrier free access to basically your, your article, which means anyone um, who does any kind of research would be able to read and um, access your article. Yeah. Not to worry. Um, for those articles published in this um, these journals, the same standards of peer review that is part of your traditional subscription journals is also applied here. So you will go through the same process. Next, we have Sage Choice, which allows authors to publish their article open access in hybrid Sage subscription journals. Um, this. This is actually an offering that we have um, as more funders actually put in a requirement to, fund, uh, to, to publish research papers that they have funded as open access. Um, and also it allows the authors um, to publish in the journal of their choice. Yeah. And lastly, we have the green route um, where manuscripts um, that are submitted under this, um, the authors are actually allowed to share their original subscription or accepted manuscript after, at any time in any format after your paper has been accepted. 
So um, if you are new to publishing, um, you know, uh, and you are wondering how you do so, uh, we have several tools that you can use that will help you in your journey. So we you can do um, a direct submission and you can use our journal recommender, which is the tool available to help you uh, narrow down the search um, to the journals that fit your topic. So the tool will then use um, the keywords that you have input to verify against the aim of scope and uh, basically give you a couple of recommendations for your consideration. We also have SagePath, which is a tool that will actually um, do, it starts with the same journal recommender um, and then it will move on where you can actually uh, indicate here are my preferred journals and it will be sent to a team who will then um, liaise with the editors and submit the article on your behalf once the editor has um, accepted your article. Um, if you have actually pub uh, attempted to submit to a journal and uh, were not successful, you can also use this tool to, um, to see what other options, what other journals um, can be relevant um, places for your, for your research paper. We also have the Sage Discipline Hubs, which um, allows authors to explore our range of journal portfolios and to discover more content from various disciplines. So you can have a look uh, and dive in a little deeper. So this is uh, actually a handy site for you to research on various journals and also to stay updated on new publications. So uh, we also have a couple of resources that you can uh, go through. We have guides, um, webinars, and uh, blogs that will uh, guide you on your journey to kind of uh, take you through step-by-step step to understand and to help you along, yeah. And um, should you need more end-to-end -end support, we also have Sage Author Services, uh, where you will work with experts in the subject area as you prepare your manuscript for submission. So uh, we have editing services, uh, plagiarism check, um, our preparation, we, we do end-to-end -end, basically, yeah. So um, as I mentioned uh, previously, Sage um, plays an active role in open access. So uh, if you're publishing open access, you have there is a open access portal where you can um, go in and basically uh, submit your article and uh, the whole processing uh, workflow will happen from there. Yeah. So for the authors who are affiliated with institutions that have open access agreements, um, you will also be able to use this portal to manage your open access publishing. Yeah. And um, we actively work with various national consortia to develop um, such deals so that, you know, uh, we embrace open access publishing together with the institutions. So we, as, uh, as I mentioned, we have quite a few worldwide, but I would like to focus on the Australia and New Zealand call agreement. Yeah. So the current agreement is from 2023 to 2025. Um, so authors who are affiliated with the Australian and New Zealand institutions who are part of this agreement will enjoy unlimited hybrid OA publishing for Sage journals. If you are publishing um, in the Gold OA journals, you get a 20% discount on the publishing fees. This is the uh, article processing charges that uh, was mentioned previously. Yeah. And to tie back to our uh, team, Sage actually has a wide range of uh, journals covering uh, the mental health. <laughs> so, you know, you can have a look um, and see which uh, areas you, you are researching on and which journals uh, fall within that. So we have developmental psychology, attention disorder, psychiatry, cognitive psychology, and a lot more as well. Uh, we also have the mental health collection, which you can uh, have a look and also that to do your research to, to find the appropriate um, journal uh, home for your for your research papers. Yeah. So should you have any questions, uh, you can either contact your institution librarians 
or you can contact me directly as well. Thank you. Thank you, Halima. Thank you. And, yeah, I, and uh, uh, that is all for today. Thanks very much to all our guest speakers for sharing with us the advances in research of mental health. And uh, let me share. And so we also have a great series of resources about psychology and mental health to facilitate your research. So uh, be sure to scan the QR code and fill the questionnaire and check this out on our website. So uh, if you have registered today's session, we will also be sending you an email which contains of this webinar's recording and other materials as well. So that's all for today. Once again, thanks uh, very much to thanks everyone for joining us and have a lovely day. See you next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.